really cool, uh, really cool session. I mean, it's definitely certain something really different from what I, uh, what we usually do. Um, we today are going to talk about our Stanford Virtual Heart project that uh, that we've been working on uh, for a while. I saw that. I saw it, so I'm happy to share this with you today. Uh, my name is David Axelrod. I'm a pediatric cardiologist here at Stanford. Um, I specialize in cardiac intensive care for um, children that have critical heart disease. Um, and my partner in this uh, is David Sarno, who's from uh, Lighthouse, and we together work um, partnered on this at Lighthouse. Um, as we go through, just quickly, so that you know, I'm the lead medical advisor for Lighthouse, and I do a share equity in the in the company. Um, I'm going to let David start with a description about where this all kind of came from. So I, I like to show people this slide because it's uh, from my own childhood, and this Atari 2600 is kind of one of the first consumer video game systems that you could buy in the late 70s. It came out of the same people that made Pong, the first kind of the first popular video game. Um, and I had this game when I was a kid. This is Superman, and um, it, I just like to show people sort of the trajectory of what video games. How, how far they've come, and this is what <laughs> Superman was. It's almost a little hard to even understand what's going on. Harder than harder than the, the box painting. Um, yeah, it's like where is he going? He flies up and then comes up through the ground, and it's uh, you know kind of a strange, a strange game. Um, but then you know, 30 years later, you have games that look more like this, where it's getting close to photorealism, and there's this amazing you know. Com completely artificial, you know, city and beautiful, you know, water looks really realistic, and um, so uh, you know, it's just sort of a how far we've come kind of idea, um, and you know, the entire video game of Superman could fit in the little tip of Batman's cape on that side, and um, it's part of the idea of this is that the work that we do builds on this technology that's been being developed by the video game industry and also the animated film industry, Pixar and, and these people, um, who have over decades been working on you know, pushing this visualization technology to be able to conjure all kinds of different crazy worlds, alien wars and you know, uh, and talking animals and, and everything you can imagine. But so much of it goes into this sort of fictional otherworldly storytelling in video games and movies. And not that much of it goes into explaining the magic you know, elements of our own world and the mysteries that we deal with all the time, um, of which there are an <coughs> infinite number. And so that's kind of what we have done, is borrowed this great gift of this storytelling technology from the fiction world and the game entertainment world and started to apply it to topics that you know have a lot of, of import and in including in, in healthcare. And so that's where we kind of intersected, David and I <coughs> came together um, because you know I work with um, babies and children, some adults as well that have congenital heart disease, <coughs> um, which is an abnormal formation of the heart that happens when a baby is forming in utero, so in, in the embryonic heart development. Um, it's there are countless variations. It's exceedingly complex. It's really difficult to understand in your mind's eye and also to teach other people, either trainees or also families, what's going on in the heart to try and get a three-dimensional visualization. And um, it's been really amazing to use kind of the video game technology um, to, to describe and explain this for, for those populations. And that's, that's what this is all about. Um, to take you back a little bit, um, this is an actual drawing um, <laughs> that um, we have here a, a, a world-class uh, heart center. I'm really fortunate to work in it. Uh, we have a world-class surgeon who, um, in fairness, was about to go into the operating room to operate on a, a three-month-old baby for a 14-hour surgery. And this was the surgery he was going to describe. And so he wrote this down <laughs> and said to David, you know, this is what I'm going in there to do. Clear, right? <laughs> so it wasn't exactly clear. And so we took this to our animators. This is back in 2013-14. And we were able to create something that's a little bit more recognizable. This is the aorta. It's a major blood vessel um, that comes off the heart. And you can see these um, blood vessels that come off of it called collaterals. And you can see that we're about to make something kind of interactive. And then we put some color onto it. And we're going to show the surgery that we're going to do. And the next step that we did is we were able to create a online uh, iPad app that actually allows you to 
interact with this so that you can actually see now a little bit more three-dimensional. Um, it's still on a flat iPad screen, but you know we're, we're getting closer to real life. It allows you to, to simulate the surgery that our surgeon performs here. You're going to see you're going to throw some stitches coming in here in a second, right? And so, so this is kind of what we're using to describe to patients um, and also to trainees these very complicated concepts. So that was about three or four years ago. What I'm going to do now is switch, switch to today so that you can see what we're working on now. And so this is the Stanford Virtual Heart. And so what we've got here now, this will project, there you go. Yeah. Let me ask, do a quick kind of homage to, can you, can you see over, you look can you see what I'm seeing? A little bit higher, yeah. there you go, okay. yeah, right there. So uh, there's that plastic heart there, mm -hmm. and then right on the table next to it is an edition of the Stanford Medicine Magazine, which magazine is the one right that there. you folks <laughs> are passing out, <laughs> heart editions uh, from a few years ago. Um, so we, we constructed this room. Uh, on the other side here is uh, Gray's Anatomy images, the, the old traditional way of you know teaching people about anatomy. Some beautiful old images, um, and this is our this is our first version of doing the same thing here. Is we're trying to explain the many different kinds of congenital heart defects uh, that kids are born with. And so this is the beginning of what's going to be sort of a library of, of many of those different defects. Um, and uh, we'll start by showing you a couple of them. But for the kind of group interactive part of this, um, besides getting a volunteer up here in a second to do some of this, we also, as we go through this, um, be thinking about how this approach um, can be used for something in your own specialty or if you're not a physician or a healthcare professional, any, any, anything. How would you use this form of explaining and what kind of topic might you choose and what comes to your head? And then we can talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, so as you can see, we're in virtual reality and my hands, the, these controllers are tracked. They're pretty much exactly uh, where they are in reality. Um, and the fidelity is, is quite good. So I can manipulate what's happening in this virtual reality quite well. And let me know if you can't see what I'm seeing. But Look up a little bit. There okay. you go. Right down a little bit. Right there. Okay. To the right a little bit. Okay. There you go. Okay. So I'm grabbing, see this little pincer? I'm pulling the trigger. And this can grab this uh, dotted circle here. And then the other thing we can do is grab this handle and pull it outwards. And then rotate. <coughs> see. Uh, and then the other little tool is this flashlight thing here. So that's telling us what we're looking at, the right ventricle, left ventricle, aorta, pulmonary artery. And we can even kind of reach out and grab this. So there's the ventricular septal defect there. So that's a hole that's in the wall of the heart, abnormally formed in utero. We're going to have one of you guys come up and teach all of us anatomy and physiology. <laughs> <laughs> this has been really quite fun. It's been um, you know, amazing to, to think about how we can really change and improve the way that um, medical students, um, residents, trainees, all healthcare professionals can learn three-dimensional concepts in, a, in an advanced way. And we think that this is um, going to vastly improve the, um, the educational quality of radio There's more to it, but we can have a volunteer come. Somebody want to come up and try it? The rest of it. It's pretty easy. It doesn't make you sick. Yeah, come on up. Watch out for the board, it's made. Under this one, over that one, because I can't look at them. There you go. Great. <laughs> So as we do this, what we're going to do is... So are you just using off-the-shelf VR technology, or is this just an Oculus? Yeah, so this, yeah, so this runs um, um, off a super high-end graphics card, um, so not your regular laptop. Um, and then um, our program will run on any of the VR, you know, commercially available VR programs. So um, one is like the two kind of biggest names are the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, um, and ours will run on either. 
um, we Oculus is you know right down the road they have a Facebook um, and so they actually uh, through a donation <coughs> support as part of the development of this which is my last slide um, um, uh, but um, it'll run on so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you actually instruct us. Sorry, what's your name again? I'm Anne. Anne. I'm going to have Anne instruct <laughs> all of us. She's going to teach us what a VSD or a ventricular septal defect is. So you pull that heart off the shelf. You're kind of <clears throat> we're going to have uh, you know 20 to 25 of the most common congenital heart defects will be available. You've taken ventricular septal defect off of the shelf because either you're a student or you're a trainee and you want to understand it, or you're a family that's had a baby that they just told you has a VSD and you don't you don't understand you know what that is and you want to learn about it. So what I'm going to have you do is if you can reach out um, to the um, part, uh, the big chunk of muscle right in front there, and if you reach out with your right hand and yeah, pull that one out of the way, and then that one that's right there. Yes, grab that, a yeah, little bit deeper, there, grab that, and pull that out to your face and actually look at that hole. So can you see right there that hole? You look a little bit higher with your head and pull it, your hand down a little bit. I'm just going to allow the audience to see right there. Great. So you see that hole? Yeah, you're actually shining the yellow light right through that hole. So that's an abnormal heart uh, hole that's in the, in the wall that's between the two ventricles. So they're supposed to be separated. It's not supposed to allow blood to go from one to the other. And so that's what you're seeing there. Um, as you look at the whole heart, you can either leave that there or you can put it back. You can spin the heart around to get a look at the uh, different sides. There's the hole again. You can look at the valves. Um, there's the pulmonary valve right there. Um, if you look at the other valve, which is the white, that's the tricuspid valve there. Um, and then you can really inspect all of the anatomy of the heart. Um, when you're ready, if you're, once you're looking at that, if you'd like, you can, yeah, you can take another look, look at other parts. There's the four pulmonary veins coming into that left atrium. So after blood goes from the right side of the heart, it goes out to the lungs and picks up oxygen. Then it comes back to the pulmonary veins to this left atrium. And then it goes out from the left atrium to the left ventricle to the body. Now you're looking at the right atrium. Once it goes to the body, it then gets collected here in the right atrium. It's looking for the fossil valves. Yeah, so if you, um, let's see, if you, um, grab it, grab the right atrium. And if I can just adjust for you here. If you look right there, can you see, it's a little bit hard for me to point for you, but if you look right there is the fossil valve. See that? So the eustachian valve is actually this ridge of tissue that's going, you're not going to see this hand, but everyone else can. The eustachian valve is this ridge of tissue that directs blood to go to the fossa of valves, which is right there, which is a really important structure in, in the fetus. Um, and it can just be really difficult to get people to understand. So when you're ready, you, actually you can take one half of a step back. Right there is good. And then if you uh, look down at your hand, there's a red button on the front. If you push that red button. Yeah, that's it. There you go. So now you're actually inside this heart. So if you look up, so, there, so there's the VSD, so there's the tricuspid valve, right? So this is the tricuspid valve. The blue red blood cells represent red blood cells that are deoxygenated. They come back from the body, they dump the oxygen to whatever organ you're using. If you're thinking a lot, it's your brain. If you just eat a meal, it's your gut. And the um, deoxygenated blood comes back into this um, right atrium through that tricuspid valve into the right ventricle that you and are standing in. <clears throat> and then if you look uh, way up, straight up, there's the pulmonary valve. So this right ventricle is, yep, squeezing is uh, squeezing blood out the pulmonary valve. Oh, that's right. Um, that's then going to go to the lung. look up a tiny bit more, just to crank your head up so folks. There you go, right there. <laughs> that's all right. And um, you, the label is actually off the, the R screen, but you're seeing a label that says pulmonary artery, which is out there. So the blood's going out to the lungs to pick up oxygen. If you then look down again and to the right, you'll see the ventricular septal defect and point at that. So there are ventricular septal defect. Now, if you hold with this trigger, hold that trigger down, keep it held. So that's the normal heart, right? So that's a heart that doesn't have a VSD, a ventricular septal defect. You can see there's no red blood cells that are colored red coming through that hole. The ones that are colored red, that signifies that they have oxygen already there. So if you let go now. So now here come the red blood cells through that hole and that's not normal, right? So they have a normal amount of oxygen that goes around to their body, but what this is doing is it's allowing blood that already has oxygen to come back and go to get more, what well, doesn't get more oxygen, it just goes back to the place where oxygen is received in the lungs. And so it's inefficient, and that's what happens with these babies. Um, so you can look around a little bit, you can um, interact with the, the little heart in front of you, um, 
in our next version, which we're not going to show you today, but you can actually transport into each chamber of the heart. Um, you can look at the valves and their relationships. One of the things that we teach trainees a lot is, is what's called relational anatomy. So the best example of that is if you want to know, for example, when you're looking at a heart ultrasound, where is the right pulmonary artery? It always sits underneath the aorta. So you have a candy cane of the aorta and the right pulmonary artery is right underneath it. And when you, if you close this heart back together, which you can do when you, when you leave the... Yeah. So, and then if you spin it, see the right pulmonary artery just underneath that candy cane of the aorta. And so we can actually tell people, like, look, this three-dimensional, you know, pick it up, look at it, bring it up to your face. That's what you're, we're trying to teach you for, for three-dimensional reconstruction in, in, uh, in your head. <coughs> How are you doing in there? Very cool. You good? You want to try uh, a very brief surgical repair? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so if you um, push the red button again to exit. Uh, actually, I'm going to just bring that heart back here. And then if you look to the right, there's one that says transposition. It's in the middle row there. That one, yeah. Pull that one out. Transposition, you can see the blood vessels are formed incorrectly there. They're located in the wrong place. The aorta actually came off the right ventricle. And the pulmonary artery actually came off the left ventricle, which are two independent circuits that you can are see incorrect. In the, back, the hearts in the background have it You can see these, right? So these are correct in the back. Pulmonary artery comes off the right ventricle. This is backwards. So what you need to do is you need to pick up that yellow ball with your controller and put it where the blue ball is, deep in the heart there. There you go. And then it's going to prompt you to do this next one as well. So again, training people to understand what the congenital heart surgery is. So for me, right, when I'm at the bedside taking care of, her, of a patient, that comes from this surgery and I'm there at 2 a.m. and if something's going wrong, I absolutely have to know exactly what happened in the surgery. I have to understand that. And I've spent years to kind of get that information straight so that um, I can take care of the patient or if something's going in a way that, I, that is not a good clinical outcome, I understand what's going on. But we think equally important for parents, right? If your baby had transposition and they had this done and, and we see, unfortunately, patients that come five, 10 years later and they have a scar in their chest and they don't know what surgery they had. And we just don't, that's just not the best model for healthcare delivery is to have people not invest in understanding their health. So Anne, you did a great job. You're now like teaching us all VSDs. Thank you very much. Um, we will be around, um, I'm gonna go through a few more slides, but we will be around if anyone else wants to try it. Um, it's kind of a fun, fun demo to, to work with. Go forward, let's see. Could I just ask one question? Please. You, you said that there was an incredible number of variations. Yeah. So to what extent would looking at this help somebody or would they find that they were in a situation that was so totally different? Yeah, that's a great question. So you're talking about patient-specific cardiac anatomy versus the general, you know, what we build these from scratch. So we build um, uh, the resolution and the interactivity and the ability to jump inside is, um, requires such high fidelity and, and such uh, high resolution that we build these, we have our, our gaming artists build this. Um, and we find that um, in general, the vast majority of them so um, are, can be grouped into main categories of congenital heart defects. So for example, that one was a ventricular septal defect. It's a specific kind, it's a muscular mm -hmm. one because it's in the muscle. Remember how it was all combined, or, uh, surrounded by muscle? There are say three or four different main types so that if somebody's baby had a, a muscular VSD, it may not be that exact uh, location and you know right exactly there, but I can get them to understand enough in a much better way than what we usually do, which I'll show you in a moment, by using this. Um, at some point, what we will get to um, is taking actual patient scans and getting them into VR. Um, but the resolution right now of those scans doesn't allow us to, to offer the experience that, that Anne just had jumping inside. When the surgeon is operating, is is he, um, look, he's looking directly at it, or does he see this enlarged onto a camera? They, the is surgeons it, is it, is in, in real me? reality, when the surgeons are actually doing the, the surgery, they have on what are called loops, which are, you know, like um, uh, magnifiers, mm -hmm. um, and they directly look at, at the hole, and then they put the patch on the hole. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's, that's where we were, and then we went, a couple months ago to the Stanford Medical School, you know, world-renowned med school, and this is what, what we saw in their anatomy and physiology class for the head and neck. And so <laughs> for those of you who went to medical school, you know, for me, 20 years ago, this was the way that it was. It was pretty flat. I, I learned, you know, most of it. 
Um, this is how it was 20 years ago. This is how it was 200 years ago. Um, and so we kind of we think that there's just you know there are, there are multiple modalities and, and really a lot of opportunity to, to improve on this. One of the things we're doing here at Stanford in the in the pediatric cardiology group is we run this fellows boot camp. It's actually next weekend. It's here. We bring uh, 45 to 50 fellows from all over the, um, the North America come to do a three-day weekend hands-on session where they learn um, the things they're going to need to learn to be cardiology fellows, so advanced pediatric trainees. Um, and as you can see, one of the things we do is we, we dissect animal hearts. So I have this relationship with this farm, and they send us these hearts, and then we, the people dissect them. It's great. They learn a lot. But you can almost get the sense that like they want to go in. They want to be in there and like actually really get inside. And it's actually difficult when you have a heart um, that's not moving, it's not alive, it's not beating. Um, so how do you take trainees like this and eventually make them learn everything so that they can get to you know where I am at the point, sitting at the bedside, taking care of these, these kids? You know, what are the steps to get there? So that's on the training side for, for when you're trying to get physicians or really healthcare providers, nurses. Um, I'd love to see this in you know schools and in um, in uh, science museums to help people understand what the heart is and what it does. The other really important group that we're um, working with are families, and so this is actually a drawing that I did for a family about five years ago. They had a very complex congenital heart defect that requires a three-stage surgery. And so this is literally how we do it when we have families come in. We go to the whiteboard, we pull out the pen, and we draw it. And th this mom um, actually, I'm using this with permission, she actually sent me this two nights ago. So she, they saved it, right? And they like, they cherish these pictures because this is their child's heart. So she's had this whiteboard picture with her for five years. Um, but you know, you can see I'm describing a three-stage surgery here. Here's the first stage. This is the patient I'm taking care of, you know, after that surgery. Um, and you know. Does that really prepare that family to go into a surgery where you have a baby on a ventilator with chest tubes and a, you know a sternotomy? Um, I'm not sure. I think we can do better. So what we did actually is we brought that mom. That is that mom, and this this is the boy now. He's he's I mean five years old. Um, we brought them in to show them what it is that we're doing, um, and they were just blown away. They uh, this was for a story in the in the Boston Globe um, uh, business section. Um, and she actually, when she came that day to prepare to get those pictures taken, she brought these hand-drawn pictures that were, you know, between four to five years old of each stage of the surgery describing exactly what happened. Um, we had patients say to us, you know, we had this heart disease in our family for 10 years, and now with, with how you're describing it, now I really understand it. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, so that's the work that we're doing. We'd love to share if you guys want to try try it out. Um, you're welcome to come do the demo. Um, I should uh, acknowledge the, the support that we got both from the Division of Pediatric Cardiology and here at the Betty Irene Moore Children's Heart Center. Um, and also, as I said, Oculus VR um, donated uh, uh, to, to allow us to build this and also gave us the in kind, the, the ribs. Um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Also to hear what things do you think you, you know, would be interesting for you to build in virtual reality, or how would you see using this technology? Because one of the exciting things for us is it's all so new. The whole field of VR is so new um, that it's just really wide open. So, yeah. Um, if I can put my sim director's hat on, sometimes with the high-tech virtual reality tools that we get, you're, you're stuck with budgetary issues about the acquisition, but it's very impressive technology, but how it can be integrated into a curriculum in an effective way. I mean, have you guys embedded virtual tutors in here? How are you measuring the effect of this, of this used as an individual instrument in the hands of a novice operator or an experienced operator? Because clearly, the marketplace has been flooded with stuff that's very expensive, <coughs> unless you have a curricular parallel to it, mm -hmm. its utility is oftentimes questionable. Yeah, great question. That's a great question that we've actually, now that we have kind of the pilot built, so we can actually show people that we can do, do something with it, we've really been working on making, um, Making this so that it is a curriculum, I and mean, we're going to have we're you know constantly in the process of building, right? So our developers right now are building a couple of things, um, uh, programs that will be integrated into the VR experience that will be that curriculum, um, so that we really have kind of a VR cardiac pedagogy program that people go through, where they can. We we also you know you'll see that this has um, sound capabilities, so we have a library of all of the heart murmurs and heart sounds so that you will be listening to a VSD murmur as you watch the blood flow go through that hole. You'll be hearing that, so you'll be learning physical exam 
we're going to have the learners go through and, and we're gonna, they're going to be prompted um, not only to show the anatomy and physiology, so, okay, here's a muscular BSD. Point with your flashlight. Where would a perimembranous BSD be located? You know, you click, good job, you get five VR points. Um, and to kind of gamify a little bit, because it turns out that works. Yeah. People actually enjoy that. Yeah. Um, to think about, okay, take that patch, put it on that, that hole, but be careful. What are the things you have to be careful for if, if you're a surgeon? Um, you know, click on three things in here that you actually need to, to watch out for. Um, and so that kind of pedagogical thinking is really important to our development. Um, we, we don't want this to just be a really cool technology that shows something really neat and then sits in a corner. Right. Um, this, we want this to be a part of the curriculum that people um, enjoy, that they use uh, frequently, and that they learn a lot from, and that they can track. So we can track and say, you got 50 VR points on the heart this week. These are the things you did really well. You missed these three questions about the AV node, and you might want to go back and learn about that. So I would say that uh, that that question is core to everything we're doing because one side of it is the visualization and creating these environments that are realistic and <coughs> teach you. But the other side is so how do you get people to absorb the information and then assess that? And so that's the other potential. The other side of the potential of VR is that you don't have to do pen and paper tests and check boxes and filling in the blank. It's you can actually create an assessment device that is in virtual reality that does stuff that you can't do in regular reality. Like for instance, you know, uh, on, in all these different heart defects, when, there, when there's a defect, it changes the way that the blood flows. So you could um, say to a student, trace with your hand where the blood is flowing from what direction and what area, and it would literally kind of paint it through the air. Um, so there's, just, there's a whole new frontier of ways that you can test and have people a actively be participating in the absorption and kind of assessment of the learning. Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> from the, the patient's point of view, whether you're adult or child or the parent of a child, um, I wonder if you were to say, take the old stethoscope and have it modernized, and maybe it already is, could you actually, when you recognize a heart defect, could you let the patient um, hear it, you know, and see it, see everything that's going on, <coughs> so that um, that you could actually visualize where that defect is? Yeah, absolutely. So, if your question is if we can um, can allow patients to hear the heart sounds um, of their child's heart defect, um, the answer is right now in our next development, we're going to have those heart murmurs. They're called the extra heart sounds. So, for example, you hear a BSD murmur. We'll have those integrated so a family could go in, they select whether, you know, a number of options. So some families don't want to actually see the heart beating, so they can kind of turn that down. They don't want to see red blood cells, or they could or could not hear the heart murmur. But that they could then hear the heart murmur as they're watching the blood go through the hole that causes the heart murmur. So that they understand. So that, you know, I get all the time, we went on vacation and the kid ended up in the ED and then a the doctor heard a murmur and then everybody went really crazy. Well, the family will really be able to understand and to describe you know, what it is that's going on. Um, and then at some point we will, there are ways to, to collect digital um, uh, stethoscope sounds so that you can, you know, collect them, download them, and then import them. It's not, it's not that, that hard to do. So we'll be able to do individualized sounds as well. Yeah. Would that be the same for adult cardiology where if you have blockages, you'd be able to take um, the stethoscope and then just show where the blockages are without even maybe having the, um, the scan. Like the ultrasound? Well, <coughs> not just the ultrasound, but the um, arteriogram. I mean, you uh, have to have the arteriogram yeah. for the actual procedure, but would you be able to show the actual... Um, we can, um, what we're working on doing, and we think we can do very well, um, is, you know, extremely well, is to show people when, they, when we have the diagnosis, to be able to show that to them so that they understand it. As far as using this specifically as a diagnostic tool, um, the technology just isn't there yet, um, and before it is, you know, it's, it's got you know a number of hoops to go through the FDA and those kinds of things. So, um, so we're working more on the teaching, training, education aspect first. Yeah. Yeah. The heart is such a symbolic part. Are you sure that 
that there aren't other companies elsewhere in the world developing things that would be quite similar to yours and that it would be a waste of effort or not to run money. together or in money? Yes. Yeah, yeah, really great question. These do take a lot of time, energy, money, effort. Um, so there are a number of groups that are working on different ways of, of visualizing the body, the human body, um, in VR or even in what people kind of term VR, which is you know kind of 360 degree viewing and that kind of things. Um, and there are there are some anatomic um, um, programs are out there that are actually very good. Um, we're pretty confident from the congenital heart disease standpoint, at least to begin, we've kind of taken on that um, relatively specific field, and it's a relatively small community.